like Vasquez said in Aliens, let's rock. If you're new to the tribe, Rad is across the table. Rich is behind the mix. My name is Yanni Bormeister, and we are Unity Jam, experts at turning driven people into athletes. This episode is brought to you by the Unified Movement System, the online program that balances strength, flexibility, and fitness in an efficient 60-minute workout so you can unleash your inner athlete. Your daily coaching by us, plus our epic gym and home UMS programs, extensive exercise library, private coaching group, and weekly coaching calls. As a valued listener, use the link in the description to get your first month free. Before we get started, big warm welcome as usual. If you're watching on the Unity Gym YouTube channel, remember to smash that like button to support the channel. Remember, the more people that get those likes, the more people that get this uh, content. Subscribe if you like what you see also. I'm excited to announce that joining us today, we have Phil White from ADPT Physio. And if you didn't know, Phil started work in the fitness industry in 2012, first as a remedial massage therapist, and then went on to study exercise and sports science and a doctor of physiotherapy, postgraduate degree. Now he runs ADPT Physio, where they specialize in delivering the athlete rehab experience to everyone. Phil has been a massage therapist to the GWS Giants AFL team, Olympians, Paralympians, and a number of other professional athletes. Welcome to the show, Phil. Hey, mate. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this one because it's the kind of question that, like, when I started learning about anatomy and physiology or, like, basics of anatomy during my massage course, like, it's questions like this that made me think, I want to know more about the body because, like, yeah, and went into sports science and, and another three as a postgrad physio because it's like, I don't know, it's just such a, a fun and interesting, interesting question yeah. that we've got <laughs> to talk about here. Yeah. And, so we've got uh, w Will Brownlee from, from our UMS Movement Mastermind group has asked, if I can do six chin-ups with both my arms, why can't I do three with one arm? The real question there is, Will, why can't you, mate? I mean, <laughs> weak, just, just weak. Why can't you do six chin-ups? But Will actually said to me in person, because Will's a member of our gym as well, and he went on to this question. He said, it's like, you know, if I can do um, four squats at 100 kilos, why can't I do two squats at 200 kilos? And wouldn't it be nice if the body worked like that? But it just doesn't. Um, it's just not the way well, it's, that it's, it's, we can produce force. It's interesting that you talk about the lower extremity because there is a lot more of a crossover that makes sense in the lower body than there is in the upper body. For instance, you can generally perform better at a single leg squat that, uh, when compared to a single, uh, single one arm pull up. Um, and you know, maybe yeah, so, Phil so can like with, so for an example, if your max squat was hundred kilos, you could likely do a one arm, uh, sorry, a one leg squat at 60 kilos, but you couldn't do 120 kilo two legs. So mm -hmm. there's some interesting sort of differences between the upper and lower limb. And, um, I guess we just jump straight. Yeah, that dives well, straight. Well, it's yeah. Brad, do you want to give a bit of context into your one armed, um, pull up training and a bit of how that went? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you mean my experience with it all? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> ten, well, not necessarily like bad stuff, but like how you approached it and how you, how you did it just to kind of show so, people that this is how you would get to a one-arm pull-up. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I definitely know the journey for a one-arm pull-up. I've done a lot of research into it and worked with some people that can absolutely do one-arm pull-ups themselves. My problem was that when I started the journey, um, I hadn't done a lot of research into it and I uh, didn't understand basically the prerequisites, which was the conditioning required before you do the exercises to get there. So the, the basic rule of thumb with one arm um, training is that you you work with, um, you know, a, a bilateral pull up. So just both arms working together. And then you go to um, a, you can go to assisted one arm pull ups. You do like um uh, you work through to archer pull-ups, which is like an archer pull-up is where you uh, you pull with one arm and the other arm stays completely straight on a gymnastic string. So it gives as much help as it can, but because it's straight, you're relying on that one arm. And of course, you bridge the gap between pull-ups and archer pull-ups using eccentrics. And then from there, you go to uh, assisted one arm pull-ups where you're using like a a weight on a on a pulley system, like where you've got a weight going over the bar or over the ring with a little bit of weight on there and you're holding it with one hand so, so that one arm can only do a little bit of weight and you reduce that weight over time. And then eventually you go to eccentric one arm pull-ups and then one arm pull-ups. But the problem that I uh, suffered was that I didn't develop enough strength in my, um, throughout the whole system um, with just basic pull-ups first. And what I've learned is that a lot of good coaches will say that you really want to have a one RM of a pull-up where you're doing 150% um, of your body weight. So basically 50% of your body weight uh, on a weight belt and being able to do one RM. And I definitely didn't develop that strength first. And so when I went through all of those processes, I developed uh, tendinopathy. Can, because, 
Can I, can I jump in? Is that as far as you want it to go? Take sure. That? Yeah. You, you can finish if you want. I just well, want to... well, well that, that's, that's basically okay. it, is that I, uh, because I didn't develop that 1RM strength first, um, I didn't have the synergy with all of the, the scapular stability work. I didn't do enough um, uh, passive active hanging, so I didn't develop that ability to be able to really use all the scapular stabilizers, shoulder, elbow, wrist, all, you know, just that, uh, mm. chain that system i didn't develop the uh, the strength through yeah. the system uh before i went into it and, that, and i want to put the logical stamp on this because i have a very very logical i was a mechanical engineer prior to being a personal trainer and um the thing that you you know you you the the, the obvious thing that you need to take into consideration here is that the mechanics of the body um don't change when you go to, you, you know, you, you, you've, you've got body weight, let's say hypothetically that you're an 80 kilo human and you're, you know, when you're holding on with both hands, you've got 80 kilos dispersed evenly through two, two extremities, two hands, two grip, two sets of gripping muscles, two forearms, two elbows. And then the moment that you remove one of those hands from the bar, you've got that same 80 kilos loading through only one extremity one set of gripping muscles one set of fingers one set of hands one set, one elbow and so if we if we remove all of the other variables that go into play there now you've got a which are balance and and all that sort of uh thing um you've got to understand that the that the the grip and the the muscles in your forearms and your elbows are uh, are taking an extreme amount of load when you're holding on with two hands when you're holding on with one hand you're not only doubling the load through one limb, you're also uh, exponentially increasing. There's an exponential increase in load because now the body isn't balanced. Mm -hmm. And so you're yeah. not only taking the additional 50% of just general weight through the limb, but you've got to understand that it's like when your head sits oh, neutral. What's that? Sorry, never mind. Hun, hun, yeah, when, when your head sits neutral on the shoulders, it's it weighs a, 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 around five kilos. When you tilt all the way forward as far as it goes, the 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 load on the cervical spine is increased by um, about a factor of six, uh, of five, I think it is. Um, so you like the, the, there's all these different variables that go into play when your body isn't perfectly aligned. Your body's really, really well designed to function at a high capacity when it's well aligned. Think of standing as opposed to trying to lean forward uh, off your axis. You, you're now working muscles in a very different way and you're going to fatigue quite quickly. You know, it's like anyone who's not really flexible, get them to sit down cross-legged for an hour on the ground. I guarantee you can't do it mm. because you're not, you know, you, you, you're actually using muscles in a different way than you are standing or lying, you know, and, and they fatigue. And so when you, um, you, you, you sort of um, amplify that concept when you go to a one arm pull up, because now the structures are not only trying to just pull your body up in a well balanced manner, because you're evenly dispersing the load across your, your, both sides of your body. Now your body has to fight gravity in a totally different way. You've got to, you've got to stabilize, you've got to balance. And the way that the muscle um, uh, motor units are distributed is uh, over a much, they're, they're spread more thin, basically. Uh, so that's the obvious mechanical uh, and, and, change and that occurs. Look, and if you look at that with what you just described about the upper body versus the lower body, I guess um, the lower body is pretty used to working unilaterally because every time we step uh, every step is there's load on one leg, but the upper, the upper limbs uh, really don't get that exposure. Yeah, and just structurally, like the hips. So if you think about the hips and the um, shoulders, they're both uh, ball and socket joints. And but with, there's a big difference in that when you think about the hips, they're really like uh, in a very sturdy object, which is your pelvis, and um, the weight's kind of going directly down them, and they're, they're, it's, everything's pretty locked in there. Whereas you think about the the upper body with your shoulders, the only bone that's touching the shoulder blade to, and your arm to the rest of your body is your collarbone. It's acting as sort of a support strap, but it all comes down to muscular control of your scapula, which is going to hold on the, the socket and then, um, yeah, and then the balance there with, with the muscles of your arm. And so what kind of the big thing here is, is leverage. Um, and so basically as you take away one arm, you've suddenly got the scapular muscles particularly are going to have a much harder job um, 
reducing the amount of force they need to hold that sort of steady position because your leverage is now massively increased. And that's why with the archer push, um, pull ups, you're actually bringing yourself across. You're not trying to go up straight here. You're trying to bring yourself kind of behind mm -hmm. um, behind your uh, that one arm. And with a one arm pull up, you're trying to get it to be the position where your your midline sort of in line with your arm there. Because if you try and stay out in that position um, without um, shifting across, then the leverage on your, your arm is just going to mean that, like, yeah, the weight gets exponentially harder to hold. So just imagine if you hold a weight out in front of you versus a weight down by your side, like that's leverage in action. Or if you do a deadlift where the bar comes way off your body versus staying right on your body, that really increases the force dramatically. So, um, yeah, that's where uh, the like the leverage aspect is the, the biggest one here, and the um, overload of those um, those muscles that aren't conditioned to, um, yeah, support yep. it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an interesting one though, isn't it? And will it's definitely uh, a good question that when you when you don't really understand these concepts, you you might just be thinking. Well, I'm, Will's I'm a numbers gonna... guy. He's a finance guy. Yeah. So I I love it's a great it's a great question from him. If you know him, it's in great context, you know, because yep. he's a he's a, a he's a literal numbers guy thinker, and it's sort of like okay, do the math. Like if I can do ten yeah. pull ups bilaterally why can't i do five mm -hmm. unilaterally mm -hmm. uh or 10 squats bilaterally why can't i do five unilaterally and mm -hmm. uh lo you know to a numbers logic it sort of you kind of go oh well that sort of makes sense you know but when you start to think it, of it from an engineering perspective the leverage the change of the fulcrum point where the now you've got to disperse muscle motor units across like in like the, the the stabilizers are going to work way harder than they have to when you're on a bilateral movement there's all these different variables in play that essentially um uh thin out spread the nervous system and the neural drive much thinner uh and you've got mechanical disadvantage now working against you you know uh as opposed to mechanical adva ad advantage and do, do you see the same things in um in like uh, in building and, and metal framework, Mr. Engineer here, I'm looking at Yanni. Like if you've got a, a piece of timber that can hold, that is rated to hold 100 kilograms laterally, if you get two pieces of the same timber, can that hold 200 kilograms laterally? Is that There's how it works? Formulas, or? and it depends on the material that you're using. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. But th this is where like engineering becomes a science because they need to work out load capacity of things, yep. you know. And uh, and when you're building huge structures, there was a lot of trial and error and, and failure, and sometimes they get it wrong, and it comes down to all sorts of things, even the mix of the concrete. Mm. You know, they have mm. special people uh, who are just on site to uh, monitor how they mix concrete so mm. that it is at the exact dose of sand as opposed to the binding agents mm, so yeah. that the structure, and it varies depending on how big the building is, how what the concrete mix yeah, needs wow, to be yeah. and how thick the concrete, uh, the, the, the um, So before we keep going down be. like this, this <laughs> kind of rabbit hole, uh, I think just having an idea of also a power production curve is a, imp it will help out sort of um, Will's understanding as well with that idea of like, if you can do uh, you know why can't i do double the amount each time and basically when you have like a peak strength so your one rm um you like there's this idea of a, a power production cu curve where you can pretty like pretty well graph what's going to happen to your uh, maximal force production um as you as you do kind of more and more reps so like it's it's not the case that um yeah you can do double what you <laughs> um you know it, that's not how like this works you have like a maximal force and then as you fatigue you're going to have this sort of um this this drop off with there so that's like if you want to have a look at that it's pretty um it works with like fitness and 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 with strength and um might be worth looking into just to give yourself an idea about yeah what you can kind of expect for like normalized values for um fatigued but yeah that's the physiology side of it is yeah you, you've, you've got a curve it's not like it doesn't go in like uh it doesn't halve each time <laughs> yeah now the last thing we should finish on and here you, sorry you can also then like train specificity to like um basically with like different types of muscle fibers so the type um type 2 x versus a or type 2 b versus a um like one is more quickly fatigable so you will get a steeper curve if you're very much adapted to that and funnily enough people who don't exercise much are going to be much more of, of that type and then sprinters or people who do lots of high intensity interval stuff will be more of the longer fatigable so you can actually slow down your power production curve drop off um by training like higher volume higher intensity stuff but you can also go the other direction and, and kind of have like a really long tail um if you train strength endurance and, and that's with with cardio and strength endurance you're basically like 
um, stopping that that um, total drop off. You're, you're trying to maintain a curve of being able to produce like, um, and that's using the different types of muscle fibers again with the type two, um, type one muscle fibers. So. So where I want to end this conversation from a very practical standpoint, because the risk versus reward profile completely changes when you go to unilateral, really heavy loaded exercises, uh, particularly chin-ups. And Rad certainly uh, suffered ill fate uh, diving into this head first without understanding this properly. So I think that's probably where we should end the conversation because it's the most valuable for people is that if you want to go to unlocking a one-handed, uh, one-arm chin up or something like a pistol squat, you have to take into consideration that, you know, if you don't put the effort in, if you don't put the work in, if you don't build that solid foundation where you allow, we've spoken on different podcast episodes, we feel the different rates of adaptation to the tissues to occur. You know, you might have the physical uh, muscle or neural drive strength to be able to get yourself close to it, but your tissues, your, your, your ligaments and, and uh, tendons and bones may not be there mm. just yet. And it's this is yeah. overload. Yeah, but I think this is what you guys do so well is that but like I love how you have each of your fundamental movements and then you have a progression regression for basically at any stage of where you are and so like because a lot of people when you don't know how to do it you're like okay I think I've just got to keep on doing more and more and more of the same thing but as Rad pointed out with the actual like exercise selection that's where like that bridging the gap of like where you are to where you want to be like you want to take plenty of steps along there so you oh, can yeah. gradually increase and that's one of the hardest things in calisthenics and body weight stuff is because you can't just add another kilo on the bar it's all about learning how to use your body weight and that's where i think you guys do it so well is like showing all the different stops on the train station you have to take before you get there you don't just yeah it's taking each of the steps and not just running headfirst into a wall and, and, I, and I can tell <laughs> anybody that's listening to this because we have a lot of people that ask us about tendinopathy and um, golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. And I can say that I have, I am completely symptom free now um, from the approach that I've taken. And I don't, I, I, it's like a distant memory for me um, that I even had those issues. So uh, there is hope for everybody because I got to a point where it was so bad that I could not grab, I couldn't do any pulling movements at all for about six months. My tendinopathy got that bad and it's just completely gone now. So you, you can, if you take the right approach, you can really transform your body in a, in a very positive way. Awesome. So thanks so much for listening, everyone. If you, uh, if you want to connect with Phil, he can be found on Instagram at ADPT physio, and you can book in for an in-person or online session with Phil at ADPT.com. Physio. And if you do have a elbow tendinopathy, I went through a bit of a personal experience where I gave it a, a medial elbow tendinopathy to myself by doing as many pull-ups and uh, wrist flexion exercises as I could do in a week. Got it pretty bad. It was really frustrating, but I mean, it wasn't frustrating because I planned to do it. But yeah, it, it was good learning experience of just how hard it is to um, try and fit the rehab in with the regular training. But the thing I really wanted to point out was it's the same exercises that um, can injure you will also be the, exactly the same things I did to rehab myself. So uh, flexion and uh, wrist flexion plus um, pull-ups were the same things that I did to rehab, but it's just a matter of that dosage. Yeah. And it, is, it is tricky. <laughs> we did an entire podcast episode on this yeah. just, uh, so, recently, so look out for that one. Uh, Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. And if you enjoyed that, check out any of our other Sound of Movement podcast episodes, wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And we'll see you for the next episode of The Sound of Movement. Have a great day.